Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Red Bra Project. We are here with episode number 79, and we are so excited to introduce our guest to you today. Yes, I'm going to give a quick shout out to my awesome co-host, Shauna. How are you doing this gorgeous spring day? I am good. I am happy that April is here, even with all the showers. I'm ready to move into spring. <laughs> That's right. I know. Warmer weather, sunshine vibes. I'm loving it. I know. You look like the sunshine today. Loving that sweater Thanks. on you. You're radiating <laughs> yellow. <laughs> so <laughs> we are going to introduce our incredible guest. She is a veteran TEDx speaker, creator, and producer of the Create and Grow Rich podcast, which, I mean, those two words together just sound like sign me up an award-winning educator, trainer, speaker, so much more, and just is the chief creative officer of Cafe Strategies, which we're going to learn more about. We're so excited because we're talking about creative thinking, creative energy, how that just kind of comes together and really is what we're needed in our work workforce right now. So Janine, welcome to the Red Roche Project. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We are so excited to have you. So why don't you jump in just a little bit and tell us a little bit about where you're coming from today and a little bit about your background. Sure. The reason why I danced with, when you said the episode is 79, that's one of my numbers. That was the year I was born. And if you look oh. at the periodic table, it's the year for gold. So I just, you know, and that's actually one of a, that's a creative skill. People who are able to make connections between unconnected areas, you want to get those people on your team. So I just wanted to throw that out there, but my name is Janine. I am an educator by trade, started in elementary K through five with the young kids, third grade. And then I went into music and creative in integration. And then I saw that there was a huge financial literacy crisis. I myself had huge debt and I was 30 years old, crying on the carpet, saying, you know, how did I get here? They said, go to school. And I did. And I'm $100,000 worth of debt. And I realized that there was an issue. So I read my, you know, books upon books. And I, my husband and I just did it. And we were debt free. And it's even online. There's a, a YouTube um, of me paying off that last student loan bill. But I started a nonprofit called Alumni 360, where I mentored my graduates of my elementary school and we talked about creative literacy, financial literacy, and entrepreneurship literacy. And then I also found myself teaching at the local university. I'm in Los Angeles and there is a school here called California State University in Northridge. So I taught teachers who are getting their masters how to integrate creative thinking but also art artistic thinking into their classrooms. So in one given week my youngest client right student was four and my oldest one was 64 and everyone in between. So I had an interesting viewpoint, perspective of the entire pipeline of life practically, right? And that's when I saw this huge need of us redeveloping, number one, protecting the creative processing of our children and making sure we're not, um, you know, ruining that, but also redeveloping the creative strength in adults. And World Economic Forum said it, the number one skill needed in the workforce today is creative thinking. So that's the work that I am so excited to be doing today. Oh, I love that so much. There's so many of us that are not using that part of our brain, thinking only analytically and not really focused on the creative approach. So um, thinking back to when you were doing music, I mean, obviously creativity has been a part of your life for a long time, that, that you went into music education. Um, was that fully just wanting to get into the financial literacy or was there a lack of funding for the arts as um, many of us know that's the first program cut in schools unfortunately even though I'm a diehard theater major myself over here. <laughs> well well the first step is really looking at the definition of creative thinking a, a lot a lot of folks think that it's just just the arts and the arts are a part of it but you have millions of people walking around thinking they're not creative because they're not excellent in the arts so i am proposing a new definition for america and the world to say creative thinking is the process of problem finding and problem solving with relevance value and novelty and creative thinkers are good at finding problems. They don't just wait for things to fall in their lap. They're out there like asking questions. Well, why is this that way? Well, well what can I do about this? And they are great at problem solving and they're great at thinking of new ideas. Basically what I just did of making those connections that no one else is making. One reason why I say the artist kind of hijacked the word um, and, I, and I'm a full art artist myself is because artists are brilliant at the creative process. 
their understanding about observation. And even though my training in the corporate world and of course my training in, in K, K-12 is about creative thinking, I bring in artistry because artistry enhances your ability to think creatively, whether it be in science, in business, in sell selling, in whatever area, field, discipline you're in, if you have an arts background and the research is clear, the science, the Nobel Prize winners, the top entrepreneurs, a lot of them have training in music, they're visual artists, they're theater majors, they understand the value of improvisational training. Mm -hmm. They understand those transferable skills. So like you said, when the funding is cut and we take the arts from our kids, we're taking away other methods of communication and other methods of thinking because your body is an instrument of thought. And Albert Einstein knew it. He was like, I'm out there dancing, you know, dancing the whatever he, he was discovering. He knew his body was a way to get information. So he was big on movement and other scientists and people who led their fields knew the importance of an artistic back background. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for that. Because I think just like I did, it's easy to silo our thinking. It's easy to be like, okay, if I'm not creative, I can't, I'm not even going to tune into this because I think only on this side. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I think it's really cool how you teach that creativity can be learned and it can, it's, it's a skill that if you feel like you're not born with it, like you guys were just talking about, you can develop it and hone into it and then use it for other things like that whole improv you know, it's not just actors or artists that, you know, or, you know, um, people in the film industry or anything that use improv, you know, everybody has to improvise on a daily basis. And so, you know, help us with that mindset a little bit. You know, you hear a lot of times people say, you know, tell us what's one thing you're creative that, oh, I am so not creative. Yeah. But I mean, you have to figure <laughs> out what to eat every day. You have to, you know, make pills. I mean, that is creativity. Yeah. Yes, yes. There's so much there. I have my degrees in psychology and education, so I'm a big psych buff. And um, because I, I, I teach with L elementary kids, or I started my career that way, I also have a lot of props. So I talk about, about the brain. And for those of you who are list, listening, I'm holding up a prop of the brain. And uh, next week, I'm actually interviewing the neuroscience director, uh, Dr. Michael Platt over at Wharton Business School. And he talks about the brain and creativity. So I'm going to be picking his brain. But a few points that you brought up there. Number one, um, people aren't born with creativity. I don't know if you're around children at all or if you've ever seen a child. I'm assuming you, you, you have. <laughs> it's innate. I have a three-year-old and I say he was brought into my life exactly at this time because I get to study a creative genius. His ability and other um, you know, infants and toddlers ability to think creatively, which means heightened observation, heightened curiosity, heightened perspective shifting, heightened adaptation and emotional awareness, you come to the earth with it. With, with it. It's the systems we bring people through, through that strip them from that and the cultures that say, don't think that way. There's only one convergent answer. So two plus two is four. Don't give me other ways. Don't give me any other way to answer that question. Even though there's multiple ways to answer that, that question. So we, we strip them of the divergent thinking. We, we strip ourselves of the observational skills. So I, because I, of my research, I now train my son, poor, poor, poor kid. Um, <laughs> you know, we walk outside and we just stand there for 15 seconds and listen to the birds, listen to the wind. I'm training his ears. And now as a three-year-old, I've been doing that since day one, since he was like one week old, he has excellent hearing and he can hear pitch diff, diff differences because I did the work. Now he was in my womb when I was teaching music and that's another thing. Um, the fetuses can start hearing sound as early as five months within in the womb. So I started his creative training at that age. So um, really educating people about this information that um, it, it is a skill, which, but you're born with it. It's protecting the skill within kids and to asking people to really do the work of your observation. When's the last time you looked at a flower, you smelled the flower, you put the petal against your cheek and you, know, you listen to the, the, the way it ruffled in the wind. That is mm -hmm. training for when you're in the boardroom and you, know, you have to see patterns. You know, creative thinking is all about um, being aware of patterns. And now my work is in intercultural creativity, which is, a, which is uh, I'll go in, 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 into soon, but 
my discovery is that creative thinking and intercultural competence, which is your ability to work with people from different lived backgrounds, which we need today more than ever, they rest on the same skills. And so if we build the creative thinking within our kids and revive it in our adults, it's going to help our ability to have that intercultural competence that we now need. Yeah, uh, it definitely starts. So yeah, I do have, I've been around children and have a couple of my own. <laughs> uh, my son has autism and it's interesting the way you say we strip things from him because, um, or from kids, because he was originally, they said, you know, didn't know how to play. Well, who's to say how he was playing was wrong. It just wasn't normal. Um, and I, and to what you mentioned, like the way that he sees the world, the way that he hears things, uh, I mean, there there is a luxury in what he, that I never had. Like to me, that's a shrill sound, but to him, it's like he can hear everything. And so if we can focus more on that, I think I just, yeah, I really love your perspective and the background and what you're bringing to it. Um, and I am so curious about this intercultural, intercultural competency, because I feel like, as you said, I mean, and we're headed now into another um, time as the trial is starting for George Floyd, like to really think about how we as Americans need to come together and, and live and just world globally, not even Americans, but starting here. Um, how did this work come to be for you? And I, I love the blend of the two. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because people who are doing diversity, equ equity and inclusion work, when I hear them speak, they they mention, you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion affects your innovation, you know, and then I hear people who are just straight creative thinking experts and speakers, and they say, you know, if you want to have a creative organization, look at the diversity of your team members. So both people are talking about it or alluding to it, but I think I'm the one that just brought the title together and said, this needs to be taught together because they coexist together. And so um, once I had that aha mo moment, because I've been doing both, I've been teaching intercultural competence, you know, in, in school and at the university level, and I've been teaching creative thinking, but to bring them together, which is a creative act, right, that, that combining, uncombining things, it was an aha moment because the psychological connection Meaning, the, and I have my seven gems of intercultural creativity because I'm the diamond person and I'm, who doesn't like a good gem, right? Who doesn't like a good <laughs> di diamond? And the first diamond is the journey. So us understanding that creative development and intercultural development is a journey. There's something that your listeners can look up called the IDI, the Intercultural Development Inventory, which is an assessment where you can see where you are on the continuum as far as your ability to be self-aware, other aware, culturally aware, and be able to adapt different cultural situations and be able to be a bridge. There are some people, as you may have, have seen in your experience or definitely on TV, who they live life only in their area and they expect other people to interpret the world from how they interpret the world, which you and I know that is not the case, right? People have many cultural len lenses. They have many experiences that color the way that they perceive different, in different environments and different experiences. So people who raise their children, which I say, I'm not the inventor of intercultural creativity. My mother is because she created a culture in our home where she put us in situations that were slightly uncomfortable, you know, not dangerous situations, but slightly uncomfortable situations. She took us to places where a lot of times we were the only black family, but to her, it was like, hey, we're here to experience it. And she really knew how to navigate between multiple cultures and to adapt where she needed to adapt. So we watched that. And she, you know, there's a funny story when she's the first one to go to college within her family. And her mother, my grandmother, put her in like plaid skirts and those high socks up past the knees and everything. And she went to the local co college, UCI, University of California, Irvine. And she looked around and everyone was in jeans and t-shirts. And she was like, mom, no one's wearing this. She's like, well, that's what I saw on TV, you know, but, you know, and it, that's just a funny story to, to, to say, you know, a lot of times we think things are the way, but to be aware of people have just different experiences and people are getting information diff different ways. So intercultural comp comp intercultural creativity is number one, it's a developmental process. Number two, open mindset em empathy is a big, 
big thing with that. You have to be able to have empathy. And, you know, that's a big word in the business world now, right? Empathy. We educators knew it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but now the business world is like, oh, wait, our leaders need to be empathetic. Oh, okay. And so, um, and so having empathy and having an open mind, open-mindedness is a number one indicator of a highly creative thinker. Mm-hmm. Open-mindedness is a number one Ill- Ill, um, number one indicator of someone who can connect well with people from different backgrounds. Number three is observation. People who know how to observe well and detect patterns and see what people are doing, that's huge. The next one is curiosity, cultural curiosity and environmental curiosity. The next one is perspective shifting. I just read a great article from Dr. Platt who wrote the book, The Leader's Brain. And he talked about business business leaders need to be able to perspective shift. Well, guess what? That's a creative skill as well. It's an intercultural skill and a creative skill. The next one is, um, I call it authentic adaptation. You're able to adapt in different situations and you're, but you're still authentic to you. So I'm not going to adapt in, in a situation and start like cussing like crazy. Cause that's not authentically me. That's, that's something that I, I just don't do. So, but, but I can still, be aware of the environment and still connect without losing who I am as a person and my core val- that value. So that's authentic adaptation. And the last one is being a bridge. Someone who is high on the intercultural competence continuum and someone who is highly creative, they're able to bridge other people t- together. And there's where your leadership is. People who can do that well, lead well in that way, that's intercultural creativity. Mm. Wow. Well, good. Right, Shauna? I mean, I'm just like, let's get more. I know. I'm like, I want to know about each of these areas. I'm like, is there an age group that does better in one than other? Because when you think cognitively, too, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, do you find that working with younger kids is better because they're still a sponge or is there... Well, I've worked with both. I work with adults now because we need the, a change. And Frederick Douglass said this quote, and it stuck with me. It's easier to, you know, to teach young children than to fix broken adults. And it's true because exactly why you said your formative years are from zero to 12. So that's when your children are building their mind mindsets, they're building their belief systems and they're building the identity of how they see themselves. And creative identity is huge. If your child is growing up thinking they're not creative and having all, I call it creative abuse. You know, you can have creative abuse, someone telling you your ideas are, are, are dumb or stupid or, or you telling yourself that. Sometimes it's not what other people tell you, it's what you're telling yourself, right? And, or creative compu- abuse could be a side, a side connector to other types of abuse, child abuse, um, just, you know, other, other types of abuse that people face. And now they think they're not, their ideas are worthless because they dealt with that other type of, you know, domestic abuse or what, what, have, what have you. So of course we want it for our kids because that's their formative years, but we definitely need a lot of work done with our adults because it's a behavior change. So there is more work to be done because now I have to dismantle all of these structures that you've built up over the past, you know, 15, 20, 30 years and change the way you see yourself change the way you see other people and make you aware that you have cultural lenses. I have this, um, and I'll send send it to you, this diversity diamond. And once again, I have props because that's me for those of you who can see. And I have a diamond and I tell people, number one, you're a diamond. And like a diamond, you have multiple facets of how you see the world, how light comes through you, how information comes to you and through through you. The facets, you know, your gender, your eth- your ethnicity, your nationality, your sexual orientation, your occupation, your, your class, the way you grew up culturally. There's so many facets of how you can process a picture or, or an experience and how I would process um, the same thing. And so making people aware that they're a diamond, they're multifaceted faceted and it's these multifacets that are going to make you stand out and we need to celebrate the uniqueness of people because before it's the conformity that work right you do this you do this you do this because of ai technology the conformity is not going to play anymore now businesses are going to i have to understand i need the onlyness of you right harbor business review calls it that the onlyness of you, the uniqueness of you to shine through because that's how innovation happens. I need you to perspective shift and show me what you see that no one else is seeing. So I tell everyone that they are a diamond. Our children are diamonds. They have diamonds of ideas within them, but our, our adults are diamonds as well. And we need to 
shift how we're treating people and allowing them to shine through. I love it. I love I'm such it a, yeah, I'm such like a visual person as well. So all of your props work so well. I've been known to bring a prop or two to our show as well. Um, but it just kind of helps to demonstrate a visual point. And I mean, it just helps it all to come together. But with the creativity behind it, I think that listening to you speak, it's really great for somebody who feels like they want to work on these things. And when you hear that you have to kind of dismantle a lot of what you may have thought you were brought up to believe or you were told or whatever you tell yourself, that it is possible to make that change and to, you know, work on that creativity and be with a more of an open mind. And in the end, um, gosh, there's so much opportunity that comes with that and valuing each other's opinions and perspectives and just, you know, it, it can be as, you know, it can be as simple sometimes I think to start somewhere with, you know, what, how does your family um, honor this holiday, whichever holiday it may be, it could be certain traditions or food or, you know, certain, you know, songs you sing and for whatever reasons, but it's cool to dive into some of that and learn the why behind it too. Yes, yes. Um, as far as the holiday we're in now or, or just in general, I feel like in general. Like, yeah, like well, when you talk to people. I'm, yeah, the like the beauty that, that I said before is like my mother is actually the creator of, of this this concept because we have our own traditions, but we were also exposed to other tra traditions. And it made me look at our traditions even more because the object of creativity is understanding that number one, you don't know, know it all. Number two, the things you know might be incorrect or need to be adjust adjusted. And that is an e ego thing. Um, I, I did a, a live a few weeks ago talking about how the higher you are in power in leadership positions, the less creative you might be because the more your ego is into play and the, and the more we want to look like we know it all and we're in charge in the authoritative position, but now we're not able to perspective shift as much. Now we're not able to say, hey guys, I don't know what this is going to look, look like. Let's learn together. So leaders who are able to keep their ego in check and to keep their curiosity high and to keep the empowerment of their team at a great, healthy, creative level those are the lead leaders you want. So my mother knew the importance of having us understand our own values and traditions and beliefs, but also being aware that other people may be having diff different um, experiences and to ask, you know, um, I'm not Muslim, but I'm, you know, fascinated about, okay, well, what is this you sell, sell, celebrate? Well, why do you do it? And then a lot of times you'll see some connections too, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, you know, I've been looking into the, the Jewish um, foundational um, celebrations and, you know, Passover just ha happened and Easter's right around the corner. But just seeing how, be just doing some research with that, how it's highlighting some of the things that I believe and I can see the relationship be between, and creativity a lot about is the relationship between things that you didn't first, you, you didn't see off the bat. I, we ask all of our guests this, and I'm curious from you. Um, you you've shifted with every, like starting in education and doing the financial literacy, moving really into this um, creative competency, cultural competency. I'm not saying it right. <laughs> um, Intercreative art. Thank you. <laughs> um, how do you push through fear? How do you not let it be like, oh, I can't do this. I've, I've already shifted once. How do I shift again? Um, I think that's something that would be so important for our listeners to hear. Yeah. And it's a big thing when you're talking about intercultural creativity, because the fear can stop us from wanting to connect and the fear can stop us from not necessarily having creative ideas, but, but shipping them out there to the world. You know, the marketing guru, Seth Godin talks about shipping your ideas and, and getting them to the people who need them the most. I was going to say this my my red bra moment, but I could just talk about about it now. Number one, courage is a skill. Like creativity is a skill, and skills can be learned. Like typing and playing basketball, it's a skill. And courage, I believe, is a skill. Meaning, the more you put yourself in the situation, the more your brain says, "Okay, I'm safe. I can start start to bring this in as my normal way of thinking." So, I dealt with a speech impediment, and I 
could not at times even say my name. I had years of speech therapy in elementary school. I opted out in junior high because I was ashamed that I, they were pulling me out of class to go to speech therapy. And you know, and sometimes kids can be cruel. And I didn't talk in class. And I thought it, my ideas weren't valuable because I couldn't communicate them well. And that's why you know communication is very important because it's one thing to have an idea, but ideas get done when they're communicated effectively. And so because I dealt with a speech impediment and it did a number on my identity and how I saw myself, that played a, a big part in how I showed up as a creative human being. And I knew I was creative, like, you know, I, I would just be the MacGyver person. You know how you can make a bomb out of a, a, a shoelace and a paper clip and a gum wrap a wrapper. <laughs> that was the way my mind worked growing up which is a very creative way because it's called functional agility. You're able to use objects in other ways than they're normally intended for, for use. So I knew that I was had a creative mind. I, and I thought my ideas would be valuable, but then I displayed it because I couldn't communicate it well. So people are maybe dealing with that type of fear. It may not be a speech impediment, but it may be another type of impediment or skewed way that they're seeing themselves. And so the best advice I can give is start small. You know, first I started speaking in front of um, small kids, you know, like teach, teach, teaching or speaking at Toastmasters and just a safe place. I started doing it in a safe place. And then sometimes you got to just take the jump. It ended up in my email, a TEDx application. I said, I don't know really what I'm going to talk about, but maybe I can tie this creative health and financial wealth together because I believe your creative health affects your financial wealth and your financial well-being. I did the application. And when that email came in that you were selected, it's like, oh man, now I actually have to say something. And the red <laughs> dot is calling my name. And that I don't even care if you don't have a speech impediment. Impediment. When that red dot has your name on it, it's it's a it's a mind identity shift. And so another advice piece of advice that I can give your listeners is when you have that calling of something bigger than you it's easier to go into those areas of discomfort. So being on that red dot, seeing 20 of my students in Alumni 360, the org organization that I have, who were my former elementary school students sitting in that audience, cheering me on and knowing that I was advocating for them because I was talking about the importance of creative literacy and financial li literacy in schools. But also knowing that this talk would be on the TED website, you know, going to whoever around the world once I just had that picture in my mind, I forgot about myself and I walked onto that red dot and you can go see it now. And I had a flawless presentation because I just stopped thinking about me and I thought about the future and what the message that I was giving. So yeah, those are my, my tips. Smart, start small, put yourselves in small uncomfortable situations, really work on your identity. Um, work on your declarations. I am, whatever you put behind I am is critical. If you say I am, and then you're putting negative words behind that, your subconscious takes hold onto that. And that's how you see yourself. So even though I wasn't doing it yet, I would say, you know, I am a great speaker. I am a TEDx speaker. And I, things I'm saying now is I am a New York Times bestselling author. Has it happened yet? No. But am I going to keep saying it? Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and because it starts in this they're not going to put me on on that if I don't even believe myself worthy to be. So it starts with de declarations. And then don't forget to take those jumps. You'll be OK. Think about the worst case scenario. Is me falling on the red dot? Did I fall? No. So, you know, um, <laughs> and then the last piece of advice is focus on the bigger than you concept. Mm, so good, because you're right. You know, we can get so nervous about ourselves. But really, most of the time, it's what we're able to do for others, share with others by focusing on that. It's like magic. It really does help. <laughs> so um, I, in talking about becoming a New York Times bestselling author, which is definitely going to happen, share with our listeners about the book cover, your, what, what you've done with your book cover. Sure. Um, well, first, my, my, my first book, which is out self-published called Debt to Destiny, Creating Financial Freedom from the Inside Out. And that's when I talk about my journey of paying off $100,000 worth of debt and how I mentally and psychologically have to, to do the mind shift to put myself in a place of building wealth and educating pe uh, pe people. And I'm very vulnerable because I believe that once we share our vulnerability, kind of like what Dr. Brene Brown talk, talk, talks about, 
it really gives people the freedom because it says, hey, me too. Like what? There's other people out there with $80,000 worth of student loans. You know, it's not just me. Um, And if she can do it, I can do it. So it empowers them to do it. And with the second book that I'm writing now, um, perfectly due out in, in summer of 2021, is The Seven Gems of Intercultural Creativity. And it has this main diamond in the middle and then seven gems in the color of a rainbow because I believe we're all gems. We all sparkle in our own way. They're all cut differently. They're different cuts and different colors. And if you study diamonds, right? Because to be able to metaphorically think well, you have to study the metaphor you're you're using. I studied diamonds and they said people focus on the carrot size, right? Like, ooh, like, oh, how many carrots is your ring? ring but the main important thing about a diamond is the cut and I tell people um you know that the cut you know could be just the way you see the world but there's also dark spots within diamonds if you look at if if you have have one the dark spots within a diamond is what makes the light spots shine even brighter so I tell my students and my clients you might be ashamed of some of the things the struggles you went through going through your life but that's going to make you shine brighter. And I actually feel sorry for the person who had no struggles whatsoever (laughs) in their life because they don't know the power of resilience and the power of regeneration. Sometimes it's not just about resilience. It's about regenerating and becoming an even better you, you know, and you need those dark spots to, to show you to you. Oh, I love, and you said it. I heard you say in the dark spots. I'm like, resiliency, I get it. And then you added it. And so, but it is true because you, you, I mean, we all have those adult friends who really haven't, they've had the luxury of maybe not really having something bad happen. And then when it does, it's almost so crushing to them because they haven't had these experiences. And so have you found that a lot in your work? And I mean, you're very empathetic, obviously. So you probably communicate well with them. I'm just curious if you've run into that. Uh, yeah, and I, I talk to parents as well because you know my my son is three and he's my my first. I work with kids, but they come to me at five, right? So this is my first time from zero to three. But as a mom, you know, it's like oh, I want to protect him all the time. I don't want him to fall. I, I don't want him to feel frustrated. But because of my research and just seeing how my mom raised us, it's like he needs that experience. I have to stand back and watch him go through that frustration, and and I give him the words. He has to just describe it, and that's another key with dealing with fear of describing the fear, using the words um, and, and switching it. But he says, oh, I'm feeling frustrated. And then we give him tools. Okay, well, what else can I do? I can look at it this way. I can find help. I can ask for help. So I'm giving him the tools because, you know, zero to 12, that's their training ground for when they're adults. So at 25, he's not feeling tr- frustrated and his whole world's falling apart. He says, okay, well, what else can I do? I can look at it from a different perspective. I can go find information online. I can ask for help. And so, um, and so, you know, there was that, that college scandal, right? A few years ago when the parents were, were paying the way of the students and people were like focused on like the few celebrities and, and the parents, but my heart broke for those kids. You know, all those kids where their parents were, were, were sitting people next to them to, to cheat on the SATs and getting them into these schools that they didn't have to apply for. What message are you telling that child? I don't believe that you can do this on your own. I don't believe that you can go through the process of working hard and having that authentic joy that you made it in or working hard, not making it in and saying, it's okay you know, I have my backup schools or I can try again. You are committing to me, that's a form of child abuse because you are robbing them of those experiences of falling and getting back up. And those are the adults you see at 30, 40, 50 who have a thing go wrong and their whole world falls apart because their parents rob them of those experiences. Um, So my heart broke for, for the kids because of what the parents were communicating to them just so they, they, they can, gloat that their kids at USC, you know, and that's a whole other conversation of branding colleges, like (laughs) a school is a school, you know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are such great valid points. And I mean, you mentioned tools and when we learn them as kids, it makes it so much easier in our adult lives. Um, But that doesn't mean you can't learn the tools as an adult either. And so, you know, what are some ways that people can connect with you, Janine, and kind of 
learn from your resources and learn from you and get involved. Sure. Well, I'm sending this message out to the world. Intercultural creativity is the training for this new era. I am always posting, you know, tips, ideas, research, and just fun quotes, impactful quotes on my LinkedIn. I am on a Facebook at, you know, Cafe Strat Strategies, C-A-F-F-E strategies.com. That's the name of my organization uh, for tra training. And also Janine Letford. I'm on Instagram at Janine Letford and F at Cafe Strat Strategies and Twitter as well. And I just believe that people are going to wake up, number one, for themselves, but also for their children about how important intercultural creativity is going to be moving forward. That's great. I know I kind of messed you up with your red bra by asking about uh, the fear <laughs> question, but yes. um, as, as you know, the red bra, you know, it, it, it really is um, a symbol of confidence. It's um, either outside your clothes or inside your clothes, however you want to interpret it. It's a moment where you put that bra on and you got out there and did something that you didn't think maybe before that you could do. Um, if, is there another one that you can think big or small that you would like to share? No pressure. <laughs> You're nodding. Yes, We're yes. excited. <laughs> and I, I think this one will connect with, with pe people. You know, I have my background in, in education and teaching, you know, kindergartners how to clap on, on the beat. And then Charles Best, the CEO of DonorsChoose.org, a national um, organization that helps teachers get supplies into their classroom asked me to join the board of directors. I didn't even know what a board of directors was. And I was like, you know, oh, okay. Cause I'm, I'm op openness to experience, right? I go to these meetings, the CEO of LinkedIn, the senior vice president of Facebook, the top woman investor in the nation is on this board. Stephen Gao, Yvette Nicole Brown. I'm like, these are heavy hitters. And here I am like, wait, wait, what, you know? And so I immediately had that imposter syndrome. I immediately dealt with just not seeing that I, I was good enough because these people are running multi-million, billion dollar businesses. And I have a classroom budget of a thousand dollars for for the year. So that was a whole shift. But once I realized, I think someone said a comment, I was like, wait, I had that same comment too, or that same thought too. It's like, wait, I can do do this, you know? And they actually looked at me as the expert in the room because this organization is about servicing teachers and there was no teacher on the board. So remember perspective, right? And once I realized, it took about, about a year, so I'm not gonna say, oh, the second meet meeting. But once I realized, like I put that red bra on, right? I realized that my ideas had value and that they were actually listening to me and that I gave good feedback it, it was like you sit up a little bit straighter. And that's why I just wanted to empower people. People have expertise in so many different areas. Look at where you shine. You're the onlyness of you, that diamond, those diamond facets, and just stand up straighter with your red bra on and give us what you got. Mm, I love it. It's like a I know. talk again. I, I mean, so good. <laughs> these just all these insights and perspectives. And you actually, you have an online event coming up. Is that open to the public? Well, we, um, April 21st is United Nations Creativity and Innovation Day. So I'll be bringing some people on to LinkedIn Live around 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mm -hmm. And then on April 8th, I have Dr. Michael Platt talking about the brain and creativity and what's going on in the brain. That's at, I believe, 1 p.m. Pacific Time, April 8th on LinkedIn Live, but I'll be sharing it as a podcast as well. But, um, but yeah, so those are free. They can pop in or they can just watch the replay, but just stay connected because we do have some you know, creative, as life starts opening up again, some creative conferences coming up um, and then going on a retreat. When do you want to get away? Being in nature is a huge thing. So getting people back out into nature to reconnect to their creative source would be great. Yes. I can't wait for that. That's awesome. And of course your podcast is an awesome way to connect and hear your incredible guests and perspectives though. So. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes, we will be sure to link all of that for our viewers and listeners so that they are able to connect with you um, because we're all going to want to be a part of this New York seller's best book here, you know, so <laughs> if we all keep putting it out there, it will happen. So. Yes, yes, and this is the place where you heard it first. I haven't really shared it besides just in okay, my own house, yes. so. We love Red Bra first. <laughs> 
Well, Jenny, we end every episode with a quote and the quote that we selected for you is, there is no doubt that creativity is the most important human resource of all. Without creativity, there would be no progress and we would be forever repeating the same pattern from Edward D. Bono. I just I thought it. that everything we read about you, that was perfect. And I love that you don't stay in one lane, that you continue to shift and share with everybody the great things that you're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you for having me on and sharing on this amazing, powerful platform. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. We're so honored to have you. And everybody, um, if you're not already following us, make sure you hit that subscribe bell and um, get the post notifications for all of our new um, episodes. We're also on podcast now. So everywhere that you're streaming, all the big ones, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening, go ahead and uh, download the episode there. You can find us over on Instagram at the Red Bra Project or the Red Bra Project.com. And we are excited. Thank you, Janine. We will get all of your info linked out to everybody. Thank yes, you. Shine, shine bright. <laughs> shine bright like a diamond. Oh. That was awesome. Have that was the best. <laughs>